Coming up, ritual offerings in classical Mesoamerica. Guy de la Bedoyer explores life in ancient Rome. story would just simply not exist without that. And an exclusive preview of Time Team's upcoming Modbury episode. Welcome to Time Team News, your monthly dose of archaeology news and discoveries from Britain and across the globe. And welcome to the Finds Shed. As you can see, I've been having a bit of a spring clean and this is all part of our wider plan to keep developing the news and bring you all the latest happenings in archaeology from around the world. I'm also looking forward to getting out into the field to bring you some of the latest developments from here in the UK. And even more good news, because as I film this right now, we have officially reached our goal of 10,000 active Patreon members. This really is your time team, and it's thanks to your continuing support that we're able to keep doing more excavations and create new episodes. Whilst it's a huge milestone to celebrate, it's more of a stepping stone as part of our ongoing journey. So please stick with us for the next phase and it's your continuing support that makes all the difference. But for now, we've got some real treats for you this month, including a special preview of our three-part dig episode of Modbury, Devon. So let's get started. As you might have heard, Time Team has partnered with the National Trust for a very special excavation at Sutton Hoo this summer. This is the site of a huge ship burial and likely resting place of King Redwood of East Anglia. In all my years exploring archaeology, I never ever thought that I would get a chance to be involved with an excavation of Sutton Hoo. That is so exciting. What are we going to do? When do we start? Well, you might think, is there really anything left to excavate at Sutton Hoo? But we'll be investigating an area known as the Garden Field, which until now has remained relatively unexplored. Got something on the magnetics in the middle. Um, that looks like a small enclosure with pits inside. Right, okay, so we'll concentrate this corner and move out over to where I, the ground sort of starts I, dropping away. And I've got John Gator with me here. Exciting news, isn't it, John? It's fantastic, Danny, that after, what, two years since we started doing the work there with Tim, um, and we got those amazing results um, to actually survey um, over the mounds and then to investigate some of the areas um, to the north in the garden field. And the responses we've got, we just don't know what they are. And so to know that Time Team is now going to go and dig some of them. I was chatting to Helen the other day, and you can't imagine how excited she is. I mean, she's an Anglo-Saxon expert. I mean, what an opportunity for her. So having said that, she actually dug in the excavations 30 or 40 years ago. You wouldn't believe she was that old, would you? But I mean, she was there with Martin Carver. And so for her to be able to go back and do more, there can't be many archeologists that can say they've dug at Sutton Hoo twice. It's such an uh, important site in world archeology. span I mean, it really is exciting. Thanks, John. And you can be with us as the action unfolds. We'll be sharing coverage with you throughout June, so look out for details in the weeks ahead. News now from Guatemala in Central America, where analysis has revealed likely ritual offerings of tobacco infusions in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. The site of El Baul in Cotzumalapa, one of the largest late classical cities in southern Mesoamerica in Guatemala, dates back over a thousand years ago, 
broadly from 650 to 950 Christian era. Over the last 20 years, archaeologists have been excavating at the site, revealing huge stone-faced structures and gradually piecing together the city plan. The excavations carried out between 2006 and 2007 concentrated on an area where lots of obsidian debitals should have been found to see if the nearby buildings were related to the obsidian industry. During the excavations, they unearthed a range of beautifully produced and well-preserved vessels with unexpected connotations. Professor Oswaldo Chinchilla of Yale University, who conducted the excavations, tells us more. And then when we started digging under the floors of these buildings, there were all these deposits, all these uh, um, caches with vessels. And uh, it turned out to be quite unusual because basically in, in every excavation unit, we would find one or two of these deposits, which is a lot. <sighs> more than, than we would consider normal, more than we have found anywhere else at Potsmaguapa. These distinctly shaped vessels, likely holding liquids, had been deliberately deposited in the ground, some with an inverted bowl as a lid, suggestive of a ritual offering. The, the vessels were buried intentionally, and we, we should uh, think that this was done in the context, in the context of uh, uh, religious rituals. So, um, and this, we have some analogy for, for this also from ethnographic sources in Mesoamerica, where people do different kinds of rituals and then deposit the uh, objects or um, materials or very often it's 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 about food you know food that's offered to the to deities even more curious some of the vessels contained a single sharp obsidian blade one question that i was interested in was was to see whether there would be traces of blood you know because of the obsidian blades my hunch was that uh, they may have been using used for bloodletting because because this is a ritual practice that we know about in Mesoamerica, and that uh, and also because the blades were new. However, recent post-excavation analysis of the residues within the pots has now revealed their original contents. Of the seven pots tested, unusually, three showed traces of nicotine. It's thought. This trace signifies a tobacco infusion, perhaps part of an offering to deities, similar to other parallels of food offerings, such as maize and cacao, or botanicals with supposed medicinal or therapeutic qualities. This is consistent with other archaeological evidence on site. The beautifully intricate stonework at Kotzmalwapa includes the bust of a figure, possibly a ruler, clearly adorned with what appear to be tobacco leaves, suggesting an important symbolism of the plant. What's more, the vessels were discovered near sweat baths, which are thought to be associated with childbirth and gods connected to midwifery. So the vessels and their contents might be connected in some way, perhaps as a purification ritual. Professor Adam Negrin of the City University of New York, who carried out the residue analysis, tells us of the wider potential of this technique in building a more holistic picture across the wider region. One can certainly imagine as these studies continue that these data points will start showing up and populating the, the Mesoamerican region, uh, looking at different cultural uses and actually putting a little bit better into context how tobacco is used within the region and then broadly. So that's something we imagine over time as residue analysis perhaps becomes a part of standard archaeological practice. There are certainly other plants that we would expect to find in vessels. Uh, in addition, it would be curious to know other plants which were used uh, within a ritual context. You know, this is just the beginning. We assume that as more sampling increases at these sites, we will be able to create a broader map of plant use in relation to vessel form and function. The article was published in Antiquity in March 2024, and we've put a link in the description box below. 
We had a great response to Richard Osgood's new book recently, and that got us thinking, what about a new segment, Book of the Month? And we've got a great title to start things off by old Time Team friend Guy de la Bedoyer. And here's what Guy has to say. I'm very excited to be able to tell you about my new book, which has literally just arrived. Now, it's published in the first few days of April 2024 by Abacus, and um, it's called Populous, Living and Dying in the Wealth, Smoke and Din of Ancient Rome. And this is a book I've been working on for several years now, actually, and it's um, a, a companion volume to a book I wrote during the pandemic called Gladius, which was all about uh, the Roman army, Gladius living, fighting and dying in the Roman army and that came out in 2020. I'm very flattered to say that my friend Tony Robinson of Time Team Days very kindly wrote a quote for it. Um, I I'm, I'm hesitate really to say what he said but it's very generous of him to say a superb combination of wit, first-rate research and panache. Highly recommended. Well I mean that's Tony's view um, uh, so that's very kind of him. Whether it's actually it's going to stand up to that I don't know. Um, I approached it the whole topic through a various topic, uh, various um, subsections. So for example there's the Domus and familiar, which means the household and families, the sex and passion, cursus honorum, which means the Roman career structure, the frightened city. Now, that's all about the incredible violence of the streets in Rome. It's a really dangerous place where you might have been knifed at any, any point, and people lived in real fear of that. You might also just be beaten up by soldiers. And, and, that's, and that's actually worth my while bearing in mind or, or pointing out here that, of course, the Roman army and the emperors do find their way into this book because they're a very big part of the backdrop but the soldiers are, are omnipresent but but this is really much more about all the people in Rome and as far as the emperor's concerned, it's how they were perceived by the Roman people. So you've, you've got the incredibly dangerous streets, which are full, for example, of, of the, the, um, the wealthy being carried through on their litters by slaves. There's, there's uh, freedmen jostling in businesses. There are slaves running about. These are all described by Roman poets, I might point out, or, or Roman authors. I haven't made any of this up. It, it all comes from ancient sources. The poet Marshall is, talks all the time about the spectacular amount of noise. You could hear schoolmasters screeching at their children. You could hear the chink of coins on a money changer's table. One of the things about Rome is it, it was full of an absolute maze of back streets and junctions uh, around which there were all these tenement blocks, apartment blocks in which people lived. And uh, there, there are the, the, the guild headquarters. There's often back street baths run by freedmen just for sort of very local people. So there you go. I hope you found that interesting and that I, I barely scraped the surface of what's in Populous. And Populous itself barely scrapes the surface of all the evidence that there is available on that period, uh, which I know is, is of such enormous fascination to people all around the world. And if Tony recommends it, it must be good. But what do you think about a regular book club? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below and please do recommend any books or authors that you'd like to see featured in the future. Sticking with the Romans for a minute, the discovery of ancient barbed wooden spikes. This story takes us to a Roman camp in Bad Ems near Koblenz in Germany. It's great when new archaeological evidence corroborates with what we know from ancient texts, and this is a perfect example of that. During excavations, archaeologists from Goethe University discovered intriguing camp defences comprising barbed spikes of wood embedded into the ditches surrounding the camp. This distinctive form of wooden stakes was cited by Julius Caesar in his account of the Gallic Wars in reference to the Battle of Alesia in 52 BC. But no extant examples have ever been discovered until now. While the examples at Bad Ems stem from a later period, about a century or so after Caesar, his account clearly described the same kind of defence. The site was previously believed to be an industrial site for smelting metals related to the Limes border defences, but more recent analysis, initially spurred by parch marks spotted by a hunter and confirmed in aerial photographs and geophysics, in fact show that it was a huge military camp. The large curved lines in the field that on the face of it appear to be a tyre tracks, perhaps from a tractor, are in fact the evidence of a double ditch around an encampment. 
This camp would have held up to 3,000 troops, complete with around 40 wooden towers. A smaller camp, around 800 metres from the larger site, held up to 40 soldiers. It was here that the barbed stake defences were discovered by the student team, led by Frederick Orth of Goethe University, on the penultimate day of excavations. The researchers have suggested the camp was set up there to protect the large silver mine that lay underneath the surface that was not fully exploited by the Romans. We'll keep a lookout for the monograph of this excavation, being prepared for publication. And finally, the moment I've been looking forward to for a while now, because it involves an excavation including the whole community. The three-part premiere of Thai Team's excavation at Mobbury in South Devon is coming up next weekend and we've got an exclusive preview for you to see what's in store. Hi, I'm for our brand new three-day dig, Time Team joined forces with the people of Modbury to uncover their dramatic history. We hunted for clues throughout the town, in attics, in living rooms. Everything is sort of like oh, 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 exquisite and, and nimini pimini. And under brand new lawns. I hope you've got it right. <laughs> We were looking for evidence of civil wars that raged through the town in the 17th century. But it's easier to imagine the screams and the noise and the fear. Piecing together a medieval manor destroyed in the wars and hunting for a long lost 12th century priory. Hi, my name's Jim Stetson. Okay, nice to meet you. And we were joined by Jim Stetson whose family sat at the heart of the community before they left for America to find their fortune making hats. This is the data hub, effectively. Everything that's coming in from the drones is ending up here. Everything that's coming in from the mapping is ending up here. As ever, we used the latest technology to piece together the dramatic ups and downs of the town and its fascinating history as it emerged from the houses and gardens of Modbury. This is the earliest material evidence that ever, ever to come out of Mobbury, as far as we know. Well, it's great seeing that footage again. It brings back some really fun memories of a very special excavation. It's Danny. Say Danny. <laughs> and whilst Naomi and myself are still busy working on the post-excavation analysis of Mobbury, including looking at the finds and doing the environmental samples to put together into an excavation report, the programme is ready to go. Our members over on Patreon will get to see a special preview of episode one, which is being screened this Sunday on Patreon ahead of the public premiere. And I'm hoping to return to Modbury soon for a very special screening with the community. Well, that's it. As usual, all the 3D models featured on this month's news are available over on Patreon. And remember that the Time Team News is also available as an audio-only podcast, so you can listen while you're on the go. Do keep letting us know what archaeology stories you'd like to see covered in the news. It's your show and we'll cover it if we can. So please do remember to subscribe and press the notification bell to receive all the latest updates. Well, that's all from me for now, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Join Time Team on Patreon to access exclusive 3D models, masterclasses, and behind the scenes insights.